Hi, it's Brian. Welcome back to Heart to Heart. For this episode, we spoke with Joel Thurm, a retired casting director with a riveting story. Joel's love of entertainment began in college, and soon enough, he was making his mark in New York City. However, the true magic behind his success lies in casting, where his keen eye for talent shines. As the former senior vice president of talent and casting at NBC, Joel has been part of some of the biggest productions in network history. His story is a humble reminder of the transformative power of persistence and the many doors opened by networking in the industry. Before you listen, you've got to grab our backstage pass. It's packed with Joel's top tips, insider advice, and additional resources that will give you a competitive edge. You can grab the backstage pass by going to podcastbackstagepass.com. Joel, let me tell you something. One of the th- reasons why I got so excited for you to come today is, and they teach this to actors all the time, they say, be yourself, be yourself. But you know what? Hardly everybody, hardly anybody I meet is themselves. Now, this is when I fell in love with your spirit. This is when, and I'm, I'm going to say this, and Brian's going to love it too. We're at a restaurant, a really nice restaurant. Did I tell you the story? Uh, maybe. Right. Well, you know, so, uh, um, you know, it's, it's very fancy. It's, it's Columbus Circle oh, overlooking oh. the park. All right. I'm with Joel and a group of other people. It's the first time I met Joel. Is it French or per se? No, it was a steak. It was oh, a steak. steak. Okay. Anyway, the waiter comes, says, you know, you know, it's a little intimidating. There's a, where anybody care for what would you like to drink? And Joel says to the waiter, he says, what is the cheapest glass of red wine you have uh, on your menu? And I was like, to myself then, first of all, it's a question I've always wanted to have the balls to ask because everybody wants to ask it, but nobody, nobody asks it because it's, it's, you know, it's like, oh, but Joel clearly showed me just on that simple action, he is not afraid to be himself. And I, I feel like um, in life, you know, you left you, off the other half of the story. Go ahead. Exactly. The other half of the story, the waiter, I said, what's the cheapest wine you have? And glass of wine, too. He told me, okay, I'll have the one right above that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, that, was the, that was the kick to me of the story. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> so, so the main thing is so many people would never, would always want to ask that question, but would never do it just because uh, they, you know, they, they don't, they, they're, they're afraid. Right. And, and I feel like in this business, we have a couple things to cover, including Joel's incredible uh, book called Sex, Drugs, Pilot Season. But Joel it is. <laughs> uh, has an incredible story of how he, 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 he got a start. Because this, this whole thing, Joel, is about ins- inspiring others. You can one whenever you're ready and start. And, and, and the, what, what people don't know about a lot of casting directors, and, and this is something that, uh, I, I would say is just you, you're going to elaborate, but you have a, a constant fascination with what kind of actor can play what kind of role, and that's how this whole thing started. When, at least the, the story I remember, which I'm going to have you tell now, mm-hmm. is how it even happened that you were not even in casting to getting in cast. Okay. That story now? Yeah. Okay. So I um, was working for the most important uh, theatrical Broadway producer in New York at that time, a man named David Merrick. And we had, I think, between on Broadway and was running on the road. At some time, there was like 12 shows going on. So this was very, very big time. He was little. So uh, anyway, that's, that's where I was working. And I went to work as assistant to the general manager which is a business job. The general manager was basically Merrick's hatchet man. Is this at a college, Joe? This is, um, no. And then I have to start the whole story yeah. over again because it, it doesn't make sense. I was working for the most important Broadway producer in New York, a man named David Merrick, and this was sometime in the mid-60s. I want to stop you for one second. What was your first, like in other words, you pursued an acting career, is that correct? For a half a second. For a half a second. Would this, would that first job that you mentioned was that your first real no you want me to go yeah, back further yeah, yeah. okay no because the thing was how i became the casting director you know, I know. That I was a right. okay so <clears throat> i'm in college um i'm in college i was encouraged to uh join the theater department because that's where i was told i could meet a lot of other gay guys what college 
you're ruining me. You're yeah. not giving me, oh, yeah. you know, uh, it was Hunter College. Okay. I'll start again then. Well, the point I was going to crack is that I joined the college group, the theater group, basically to meet gay guys because I was just coming out myself and all of that. So do you want that story? Everything, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This, you know, we don't, yeah there's, there's no right or wrong. Okay, all right. So uh, I'm in college. I'm a um, freshman at Hunter College in the Bronx. And I am in a bar in New York, a gay bar in New York. And I'm, a guy comes over to me and says, do you go to Hunter College? <laughs> and at first I freaked. <gasps> Someone else knows I'm gay. And he said, yeah, well, I'm part of the theater group. He introduced himself. If you want to meet other, other guys, this is one of the best things to do. So I joined the theater group. And as it turned out, that wasn't true. Most everybody in there was very closety. <laughs> so it, it didn't work out that way, but it worked out that I began to love theater. I loved, I began to learn all the rituals, all the, all the things that you did, you know, all the, you know, putting things up in one night, tearing it down the next night. And I also found that uh, Hunter College in the Bronx is a long way from my home in Brooklyn. So those red velvet theater drapes were very comfortable to sleep on. And that with enough Pepsi and uh, pizza, you could survive. Anyway, so that's how I got interested in theater. And um, what next? So, so you graduate college. What so, <laughs> well, I didn't quite graduate college. I was invited to leave Hunter College in my sophomore year. <laughs> invited to leave. I love that. Sounds I so was invited nice. to leave, uh, which had never <laughs> happened to me before because I was always the kind of student that had test marks off the charts probably still do, and a perfect or less C average. So uh, I made a mistake and uh, dropping a chemistry class. And the next thing I knew, uh, I was invited to leave Hunter College. So what do you do if you're leaving Hunter College? You uh, ask your mother for your bar mitzvah money and you go to Rome. <laughs> and so uh, and that was the height of or soon just after the Italian film business was on every magazine stand and Elizabeth Taylor and Cleopatra and all that stuff. So, and I also love mythology. So I figured, well, better to go to Rome than to Greece because I could probably learn to speak Italian. So I did learn to speak Italian. And while there, I actually got myself into three Italian movies mm. because I had met a casting director. And then Guidarino Guidi, who was, um, what's his name? Who was the great Italian director? The, um, the, the, the most important yeah, one. Yeah, he, he directed Anna uh, um, um, uh, yeah, yeah. no, oh God, uh, Fellini. Fellini. He was Fellini's casting director. Unfortunately, he didn't put me in a Fellini movie. <laughs> <laughs> I was in three silly things and uh, I realized there's no, I couldn't act. But these were like glorified extra things. So I did them. And um, I stayed in Italy for about a year and loved it. And, but then I realized, I, while I could speak Italian and learned it, I realized I could never be completely successful because I didn't learn Italian that well. I could get by, which is a pattern of mine, learning something to get by and then saying, OK, that's enough. I don't need the rest. And then I went back. So I, I came back. Um, and I made a deal with my parents and I would go back to school and get my teacher's license because, of course, a teacher would never be out of work. So that was the deal. They would support me. I got my teacher's license. And um, at Hunter? At Hunter College, yeah, K through 12. And then after that, um, I would wait at home in the morning and usually I'd start getting phone calls as early as 6.30 or 7 o'clock as a substitute teacher. And I would, I was living on 60 something street in second Avenue. So I was always hoping for the local schools, but I always got sent to Spanish Harlem. It seems <laughs> teachers never were absent in the good schools. Um, and I did that for a while. And then I um, got one connection that, um, that helped me never go back to a day job ever. And um, I met a woman, a couple, Bruce and Honey Becker, and they owned two theaters, the Tappan Zee Playhouse in Nyack, New York, Summerstock. And they were building the Bowery Lane Theater on Bowery and Bond uh, in the city. 
And I started working for them. And the first thing was a summer in Summerstock, and I was the box office treasurer of the Tappan Zoo Playhouse. That was literally the first money I made in show business. And it was then that I realized you could be a star, but you don't have to be a star on stage. You could be a star backstage in some other area having to do with show business. And, and that, that opened everything for me. So, uh, and all joke, I guess maybe it's through the whole world, you rise up through connections, which is not a bad thing. I mean, that's the reward for doing a good job is meeting other people and getting recommended for other work. And um, I met this one guy. Um, I gotta stop and think. Now this is not going to be in the show. How, I'm not so sure what directions you want me to go in because I can no, but I can talk all night. That's okay, Joel. But when do you want me to get into the good no, stuff? No, this, this is good stuff. This, this is, is human. Everybody can relate to this. Oh. Uh, you, 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 so, so this is where people get connected. So you, you so you met this one guy. You don't have to remember his name. But you, no, I do remember his name very well. So now this is something that's in the book. And I'm trying to figure out how to way I can tell the story funny. Um, so, uh, all right. so I'm at Hunter. So right now I'm still continuing um, my studies at Hunter College. Hunter College actually had two campuses, one in the Bronx and one in Manhattan. The one in Manhattan was all girls. The one in the Bronx was co-ed. But the Hunter Downtown, which is the all-girls school, had better classes, better courses, and in my normal Joel Thur manager, manner, 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 I should say, I finagled my way into downtown. There was also a little side benefit where, because it was an all-girls school, they paid me to build sets. Girls didn't do things like that. Girls didn't handle power tools in those years, but boys could. Did you so, learn this from a little boy, from a little boy from your grandfather? I started learning basic tools from my grandfather, but electric tools I learned later on in summer stock. You know, as apprentices, you have to do everything in certain places. So anyway, so there I am in Hunter Downtown, and Hunter Downtown, and I think they made a very big mistake because in their productions, instead of using the women to play the men's parts, as they do in a lot of girls' schools, they hired off and off off Broadway actors to play these roles. And that's how I met uh, this guy named Michael Warren Powell, um, who we met and then we began a relationship. But he was also the roommate of someone you may have heard of by the name of Lanford Wilson. Mm -hmm. So who we called Lance. Uh, I think it's now as popular to call him Lanford again, but he was Lance Wilson mm -hmm. at that point. And I got introduced to the Cafe Chino and off off Broadway in Manhattan. And I think that's what really changed everything. I mean, I, I became like a regular at the Cafe Chino. I acted there, I directed there. Uh, I got blown behind the bar there because that was the guy who owned the deal, the owned the place, Joe Chino. That was his rite of passage for pretty much everybody, whether you were gay or semi-gay or straight. You, you had to go behind the bar once. So anyway, um, but it was through there that I met a man by the name of Richard Barr. Richard Barr was Edward Albee's producer and produced, um, God, what's his most known work? Uh, the two character, and come on, you guys help me here. Edward Albee, Edward Albee, the Virginia Woolf. So that was the first play. And uh, so Richard Barr was a very important person uh, in Off-Broadway. And so I figured, and he took a fancy to me, and why I didn't take that much of a fancy to him, I knew that, well, if I played my cards right, and uh, what do you call it, did certain things, which uh, I was perfectly agreeable to do, because I knew that if I was dating this guy, I'd put myself in the position to meet other people and further my career in theater, and that's exactly what happened. I call this sexual networking, and there is nothing wrong with that if you're a willing party. So let me get that out. Uh, I was a totally willing party. Uh, Richard Barr was about six feet tall, had red hair all over his body except on his head. He looked like a friendly orangutan. And while I had very little sexual interest in him, he was a fascinating guy and a lot of fun to be with. Also, he drank a lot, so usually at night he passed out and I didn't have to do anything. So that was always good. But um, through, um, 
through him uh, or through someone who worked for him, who worked for Richard by the name of Michael Kasdan, Michael began suggesting me for other and better jobs. The first one was a group of theaters uh, on the East Coast called Music Fairs. And those are like 3,000 seat, mostly outdoor theaters that ran in the summer when a tent was put up around this hole in the ground with 3,000 seats. I was lucky to work in one of the ones that was a year-round one, which was Westbury Music Fair. And I, had, I was the assistant manager of Westbury Music Fair, which means I lived on the property in the trailer behind the theater. Um, but I was there for a year and a half and really got to see how things worked. And uh, from man, you know, it's it's uh, an incredible experiences there. Uh, you know, the, the week that Judy Garland was there, um, the, the, my first night there was Bill Cosby was there. You know, so but I, but I, the, the near and the the great and not so great, and and the Italian mobsters who played Westbury. You know, Jimmy Roselli sold out two weeks in fifteen minutes. He is a mob favorite. <laughs> a question. When you heard Judy Garland's voice, so yep. you obviously heard her sing. LeBlanc. Did was it was it a kind of a memory that is stamped in your head? I mean, like when I hear her, you know what I mean. Like a, it wasn't the voice itself. The voice was already in my head, you know, because I'd seen, you know, I the, who I just have to see uh, the, the way I'm, I'm thumping like crazy because um, I'm trying to get the story right. I went to sleepaway camp, and there were something was screwed up on my return home and I thought my parents were going to come up and pick me up, but no, they weren't. So I had to stay one extra night at, in Parksville, New York. And so the people who owned the camp were taking their families to the movies that night and I went along and the movie that was playing was Summer Stock. It's a Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland movie, which has some incredible songs in it. And aside from Wizard of Oz, which I'd seen before, that was the next time I had seen Judy Garland. It was like, wow. So that was my beginning of, you know, of being an enormous fan. So now we cut, you know, 20 some odd years later. And, you know, she was, uh, this is not the Judy in the best shape. She was doing this tour to pay an enormous IRS debt. Uh, sometimes her voice was there, sometimes it wasn't. But the way we met was the <laughs> is the worst part of it. Um, it was a very, very, very rainy day. And Judy and her husband, then husband Sid Luft, had come five hours early. Nobody expected them. And there was no one at the stage door because they weren't expected till much later on. And they had a walk around the theater and there was no overhang and it looked like two drowned rats. And he was fine, but she was not so happy. <laughs> but I took them to the dressing room, which was quite a beautiful suite, offered to make them tea, which I did. And then that was it. Later that night, I came back with a big thing of roses to apologize for not being there. Um, and uh, I didn't think she saw me do this, but as the door was closing, she threw them in the basket. <laughs> I later turned to told this story at one point to a friend, Lorna Luft, uh, and she said, yep, that was Mama, wow. <laughs> and she laughed. But what happened was um, the first night she walked out and got a 10-minute standing ovation just for showing up, and she was fine until one night she literally had no voice. And what she did, I thought was incredibly brave, was go out and announce to the audience, look, I have no voice. You know, it's gone. I don't have it, but I'm going to give you what I have tonight. And talk about like heart wrenching moments and things you remember. And she was right. She had no voice, but she did the whole show. And that was it. So, um, but there were other people that you need. I mean, in, in Nina Simone, who cursed at me for doing nothing. Beautiful voice. Uh, an incredible voice. But, you know, there were so many wonderful people who performed there. And then the same guy who recommended me. To music fairs later said there's a job opening at David Merrick uh, as the assistant to the general manager. Are you interested? And I said, of course I'm interested. And I'm, I went up and I met the guy. His name was Jack Schlissel. And he was the second most powerful man on Broadway, right below Merrick. He was Merrick's hatchet man. He did all the dirty deeds that he and Merrick would, uh, what do you call it, uh, would, would work up together. And, I, and it was great. He, um, 
she you know, we got along very well until I was there for about a year. And I was doing things like I would make royalty statements. I, would, I was also the company manager. I forgot to do this because it's very important. Jack's assistant also had to be the company manager. It was like a evening training job uh, with Adpam, the press agents and managers uh, union. And so after working a full day in the office at night, I became the company manager of Broadway Hello Dolly at night. <laughs> and on the first night on that job, Jack took me backstage, introduced me to Pearl Bailey, who was the fifth star on Broadway, but who was currently selling out. And Pearl took an instant liking to me. I mean, he took me back to meet her because I was going to have to deal with her all the time. But instantly, something was there, and she invited me to supper that night. Supper that night meant going backstage after the show, waiting for her to change clothes, having a glass of wine while she changed. And on the way out of her dressing room, there was a big, like, brandy snifter full of pills called Soma which is a mild muscle relaxer. So she grabbed a bag, then she said, have some, and you washed it down with the wine. So by the time we got to Sardis, we were just a little high. <laughs> and this would have been like two to three night a week deal. And I'm 19 wow. at that time, 19 or 20, no, I'm 20. So I'm going out with this Broadway star two, three nights a week at Sardis, having great food, meeting the entire world who comes to her table to kiss her ring. And I'm learning how to be celebrity adjacent <laughs> without caring. You know, I know they're not there to see me. So, you know, I'm this is a, a great story, Jewel. Looking back, what do you think it was that Pearl oh, Bailey yes. said, I really connect to this guy? I have no idea. Okay. Honestly, I don't know why or what. I think part of it was my mother was a huge show business fan, or as much as she could be without any money living in Brooklyn. And I knew who Pearl Bailey was. I knew, I mean, as a kid growing up in that part of Brooklyn, why would I know Pearl Bailey? I know Pearl Bailey because my mother was interested in Pearl Bailey. I knew two, two black female stars, Pearl Bailey and Lena Horne, because my mother was a fan of both of them. So maybe because I had some sort of a background, it just clicked. Yeah, and Pearl, right. Pearl, you know, it was, it was great. She had a great sense of humor. Pearl, she had a very good sense of humor. Yes, I can't say anything that she did, but and she got my snarky sense of humor. Okay. So uh, that was probably more important. <laughs> even back then, yeah. when you were nineteen. Were you? Yes, even back by nineteen, I was snarky. <laughs> so uh, and then one day, she said, uh, she said ABC had offered her a series, a variety series, and did I want to come to California to work on the series with her? Wow. Well out of the blue, but since at that time and through most of my life, when someone would offer one of these kind of jobs that were kind of like changing, half the time I would leap before looking, I was like, hey, why not? You know, because I, I was never married. I didn't have to worry about anybody else except me. And California is intriguing. And I had been to California once before because my best friend's father had died, left him an obscene amount of money. Uh, he bought a house in Laurel Canyon and I visited him. And I wound up moving to the same street. <laughs> wow, this is what first, first, I stayed with him because uh, I knew to take the job for, with Pearl, all I had to do was pack a bag because sublet, an easily subletable apartment, I was going to stay with Mark. And um, so I did it. I mean, it was all done in a couple of weeks. I was there. And uh, in retrospect, I shouldn't have done it. <laughs> well, was it an incredible feeling coming out to Los Angeles? Working on the show. Well, I described it. Oh, of course, it was an incredible feeling at first. You know, I did. I bought a 1964 and a half Mustang convertible. Uh huh. What color? Um, it was yellow. Okay. Wow. Yeah. I love it. Um. Well. Oh, let's see if we can show up. <laughs> and also, accidentally bought a house. Uh, accidentally bought a well, house. Well, it was, it was you know, if you look at that uh, photo. Back then it was very easy to buy a house too, right? Well, considering, Did yeah. You the loan? Um, well, part of it, the, the, there's a funny story attached to it too. But what happened is I was staying with Mark, and no matter how good a friend is, you have to leave at some point. And we had a, uh, Mark had a friend who was a real estate agent on the street. And I said to Derek, how do I, how do I look for an apartment? He said, well, look for an apartment. Why do you buy that little house on the corner? 
He said, what do you mean buy a house? Bob, that's for settled people, for families. He said, no, that's in New York. Mm. He said, California is very different. He said, if you don't like the house, you'll, you'll sell it. But for now, you'll, it's cheap enough to buy it. So this little one-bedroom house in Laurel Canyon was $22,500. Um, so I called my mother and I had some money. I had to put down a $5,000 deposit. I mean, that was for the mortgage. Uh, I had to put down five grand. I had 2,500, it was so just about in my, in that. But I called my mother and said, look, I need a loan for 2,500 to buy this house. She said, well, you don't need a loan. I'll just give you money. I said, what do you mean give me that money? She said, well, you're our mitzvah money. I said, but you gave me that when I went to Rome. And she said, well, I only gave you half. <laughs> and I said, why'd you do that? She said, because I knew you'd spend it. <laughs> so, so, I mean, that's, that is the best Jewish mother's story. Oh, yeah. That's the next one. Uh, the only yeah. thing is, if I showed you my mother's picture, yeah. you will see that my mother did not look like most of the other Jewish mothers. And in fact, the kids used to line up to take a look at her when she had to come to class every other week because I was bad. Wow. <laughs> my, sure. mom, my mom was a MILF. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she was. <laughs> hey, it's Brian. I'm dropping in on an important announcement. What you need to know is you have more control over your career than you think. The thing standing between you and the career you want is your connections. And that's where one-on-one -on -one Next Level comes in. If you are not a member yet, you can apply to join at oneononenextlevel.com. Press pause and do that now. If you are already a member and you are ready to get back on track, we want to invite you to book a strategy session with us led by myself personally. We will help you prioritize which classes make the most sense given your career goals. You can find these under the resource hub in your account portal. We can't wait to hear your success story. Drill Bailey comes to an end very quickly. Um, you know, I, cause what happened, and this is, I, I knew the show was going to fail because the old fashioned variety show was dead on arrival. Last end had already arrived, which changed the form of variety shows. And how would you say it changed the form in your Well, it changed it from more comedy. Everything was faster, quicker pace, sketches. Mm -hmm. Pearl was the star comes out, sings the song, and then invites the guest out and the guest sings the song. They sit down and they do a little bad patter and then they sing another song. In other words, it was very formulaic, very formulaic. And none, no young people were watching those kind of shows. So we knew right away that Pearl it was going to be a disaster. What day of the week was it on? Do you know? Do you if know? I remember, it was on on a Friday. I think it was on on a Friday. Now, it, and this is after Sid Caesar. Oh, way after. Oh, yeah, yeah. Way. This, yeah. I'm, I'm talking 1970 and 71. Gotcha. This, I moved to California September 28th, 1970, and Pearl's show went on in the fall of that season. Or the, she was mid-season. So she went on the air like in, around in January or something. Well, we made all the shows in advance. It was going to be a mid-season replacement, but it, it failed miserably. Okay, so when it failed, then what did you do? Well, no, but the, but the part that I loved was if you look back, the number of people that I met and worked with and, and saw close were the, the, the great and the near great of every musical era just before that. I mean, they ranged from opera stars to Ike and Tina Turner. You know, these are people who did Pearl's show. And, you know, I spent time in the editing rooms. In other words, I made the best of a, of a deal because Pearl had told me there was a real job for me. Come to California. I got this deal. You'll be working this. With me. I got to California. I realized there is no job. There was no job, but the star of the show said, uh, put him on the payroll. And that's where I learned that a star can put somebody on the payroll, even wow. though there's no job. So if there was a job, I'm sure you ended up doing something. Joyful. Well, what I did is I wound up doing music clearances, okay. which was, you know, and to me that that was a job. And also where it was slightly creative because half the time you couldn't afford the music. And I would suggest, well, instead of that, how about we do this? And if that was not available, how about this? So I learned something. And uh, yeah, so that was... Um, so that was uh, my, my first, and then there was a big, you know, after the show was over, I had some sort of a little fight with Pearl, who remembers what it was, and she fired me. Pearl? Yeah. 
So during the show? During the show. Towards the end, I mean, nothing was, I don't even remember what it was, but there was, you can't fire me, I quit. And I quit. Oh, that's and my little kids. That's a, that's a very, you know, so it was at the end. We knew the show was over. It had been airing. No one was watching it. But uh, what happened the next day, there was a little ring, a little gift box from Van Cleef and Arpels in front of my door. This was Pearl's own. You'd have a fight with her, and then she'd send you an expensive gift. Mm -hmm. So I took the expensive gift, brought it back to the studio, and said, Pearl, I don't want this. You know, I don't, I don't need this. It was, well, we talked, we talked, we talked, and I gave it back. She sent it back again, but I kind of kept it. And that's the last time we saw her until, so that would have been, early 70s and the next time i saw her i was now head of talent for nbc wow that's what I'm and about. and our uh our positions have completely reversed uh i also have to tell one great pearl bailey story if i'm going to tell the next pearl bailey story and then you have to get me off pearl bailey okay, good the um i'm sick i'm at this time i'm at merrick's i'm home i have amoebic dysentery and it was very debilitating and there's a knock on the door. There's Pearl dressed in a sable coat and a pantsuit with her faithful Indian companion, Dodi, her assistant. And uh, they came to clean my house and cook me a chicken soup. Wow. She had all the materials with her for cleaning and cooking. I went back in my chair, you know, a, a store, a, a found in the street chair. You have one bedroom house. Yeah, yeah. And I just, no, this is in New York, in oh, the apartment. Yeah. Oh. And I fell asleep, and when I woke up, the soup was on the stove, it was still warm, and the apartment was spotless. What a great story. Wow. Okay. So now we're years later, and I'm, uh, we're doing uh, a live version of the play, Member, The Member of the Wedding, written by Carson McCullers. On MDC. This is going to be, gonna, MDC did a few live, still did a few live mm -hmm. theater things at that time. And this is going to be one that was going to be filmed in Nashville. <clears throat> but it was Member of the Wedding. And I don't know if you know the piece that well, but I knew of it because I'd seen, it was a movie which I'd seen with Julie Harris basically playing a teenage boy, a, a tomboy, like a 14-year-old tomboy. It takes place right after World War II in the South, and it's the relationship between this 13, 14-year-old tomboy uh, and the housekeeper, the black housekeeper, originally played by Ethel Waters. If you know who Ethel Waters was, Ethel Waters was a huge star, one of the first black real stars. Mm -hmm. That was she was Pearl's idol. Wow. Pearl had always told me that. And uh, Ethel Waters was the first person to do this play when it originated, and she did the movie version later on. But Ethel Waters could never remember her lines. <laughs> And the producers and directors were always very worried. And her line, her answer was, when the fucking begins, I'll be there. <laughs> so we are now doing the play with Pearl. And by the way, the directors and producers who were doing this, they didn't want Pearl. Are you asked? No, I would say, I have this power, but it wasn't exercising a power, it's just being logical. Yeah. I said, we can't do this play when we can't do two and a half hours of NBC's air without a star in that role. So who do you want? And they listed several really good actresses. I said, no, this is two hours of NBC with, with a play that nobody knows. We need a star in this part. Lena Horne ain't going to play a maid, so tell me who else. <laughs> and I brought up Pearl, and they said, oh, but we hear she's such a horror to work with, and she has this heart condition. And I said, she's not a horror to work with. It, it was the usual, I think, and it still goes on today, when a woman, when a woman complains, she's a bitch and a cunt. When a man complains, he's a professional. That still goes on today. It's, I don't know why it does, but it, it does. And I said, I've worked with her, you can work with her. And it basically said, you want to do this? If you come up with a, with a name bigger than Pearl's, fine. But if not, you're, you're going to go with Pearl. And they went with her. <laughs> and they loved her. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> but I would get a call after the first few weeks. We, we, we've gone through this over and over again. She's always calling for lines. So we can't get through a rehearsal without her, you know, without her asking for a line. So I called Pearl. I said, look, I'm making this call to you because I have to. They're worried, blah, blah, blah. And then she said, you know what? And she threw the line at me. When the fucking begins, I'll be there. Just tell them that. 
So I did tell them that. Of course, they didn't know what I was talking about. But remember, this was a one night only live production. When it aired, she was perfect. She wow. didn't miss a cue. She didn't miss a line. She didn't add any pearlisms. She didn't do any, you know, hand, whatever. She was perfect. She was perfect. And that, you know, after that. So, Joe, this is what I'm fascinated with. You're, you were working for, I mean, it was Merrick, but it was a different job. And this was your first opportunity. Uh, it wasn't even though know, it was an opportunity, but they, he, he was suggesting, someone was suggesting you to be a casting well, no, what happened was took me totally by surprise one day. I told you about this man, uh, Jack Schlissel, who I worked with, the second most feared man on Broadway. Mm -hmm. And I was his assistant. So one day it's like, get in here. So I get in. What do you want? He says, look, I can't stand working with you anymore. He says, he, so he Did said, you look, remind everybody what we working. Oh, I was his assistant. I mean, this is the guy who was in charge of all the business things for the entire Merrick thing. Right. And this was a guy, his way of negotiating was to bully people. And it worked. That was his MO. You know, he would cut off his nose to spite his faith. He would, his face, I mean, if he couldn't make the deal, say, in an out of town theater, the deal that he wanted, he would go to another theater, which was less good for the play but he would make the financial deal so that the next time he went back to the first theater that he'd get the deal he wanted mm -hmm. so i mean that's the kind of way he did business and the town was afraid of him um calls so he calls office. me and he said look i can't stand working with you anymore i, I said i'm still so uh, he said look so you're going to go work with biff biff Liff, who was head of production so it was merrick jack biff and they know that's what you want to do anyway. You can become our casting director, reopen our department, become our casting director. And I said, well, I don't know anything about casting. And he said, yes, you do. You just don't know you do. And that's how I became casting, a casting well, director. Why did he say that? Tell the story. Well, I see, I, I, he said that probably because every day uh, since getting, there was only two short subway stops from where I was living. I had to go from West 4th Street to 42nd Street two stops on the A train, and then walk 50 feet to the office. So I'd always get there early, and there were no coffee machines in offices, so I'd bring up coffee from the place on the corner. And we'd sit there and we'd talk. I'd talk to Jack about what I'd seen the night before. I saw a movie, I saw a show, and I think I said one thing, which uh, I said, no, I, uh, what's her name? Brenda Vaccaro was then starring in or smaller part, but starring in a show Cactus Bar. And I said, I saw Brenda's understudy was on last night because we knew Brenda was going to leave. She'd made a big Broadway smash and she was going to go to Hollywood. I said, the understudy was terrific. She got every joke. And so when Brenda leaves, why don't we just put her in? And we can save a few bucks a week, too. So I think he heard, <laughs> especially save a few bucks a week, too, yeah. far. Uh -huh. And so that's how I became you the best. Like, Joe. You had, you but I, to me, I didn't even think about yeah, it. That's that was right. just, uh, that's you, know. you were just being you. Well, being you, and I also, I, I, I kind of knew that if I said that some an actor was cheaper, it's gonna, he's going to like the idea better. <laughs> So, but literally, that was the first thing I did, and that's how I became the casting director. So, I, I want to get to your book, but I want to talk about, uh, it's a fascinating story. In, in your experience as being a casting director, and we know you went on to NBC, um, what are some stories that, just like that, where, where you knew a specific person was right for a role, and you said, hey, listen, why don't you think about this person, and it, happened, it worked? Um, the best story I can think of that, and this is, this is Family Ties. Okay. And we all know Family Ties, J. Michael Fox. And don't know Michael, Michael J. Fox. Michael J. Fox. I don't know. Michael J. Fox. <laughs> anyway, the, 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 the story, the, the plot is basically you have hippie parents, but their kid turns out to be conservative. So, um, and it was a very smart, very good producer writer named, now called showrunner, uh, Gary David Goldberg. So he came in with the cast he wanted. That did NBC. Almost all the final editions were held in my office, which is about three times the size of this. Not just that important, but if you're going to try to squeeze 20 people into an office with an L-shaped couch and a window seat <laughs> for more viewing pleasure. So the, the, all these final editions were in my office. And Gary brings in the people and he's thrilled with. 
So for his for the mother, for, for, first we get since this is the star of the show is really the kid. So the first person he wanted was Matthew uh, Broderick. Mm. Matthew Broderick passes literally because he's going into Brighton Beach memoirs. memoirs. The next one was to forget it was the kid who went into. Uh, what are those furry little things that Steven Spielberg did that movie? Oh, like yeah. Mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, Gremlins? Or Gremlins, Gremlins, but I forget the name. Who was the kid who starred in that. Okay. was our second choice, so we lost him. And we had no third choice. Uh, and uh, the casting director was a brilliant woman said, look, I've showed you guys this guy, this Canadian kid. He's terrific. And that's how Michael got the part, because the other two turned it down. And finally, everybody at NBC loved Michael Fox, except Brandon Tartikoff, who is the most important voice. My boss, Brandon, who is head of the network, head of NBC. But he said his face, he'll never, he'll never make it to a lunchbox, to a kid's lunchbox, which is very important in those days. And we all said, you're wrong. <laughs> so finally, Brandon listened because everybody said you're wrong. And that's how Michael got that part. So once he gets that part, so that's settled. The next thing is the parents and the rest of the cast. And Gary Goldberg brings in Donna McKechnie from Chorus Line to be the mother. And Chris, Chris Sarandon, uh, who was nominated for an Academy Award, he was married to Susan at some point. Uh, and he brings them in. They're, he's a wonderful actor, but he never gets parts, and it's what happened at NBC2, because everybody finds him unlikable. This is for the father. This is for the father. Being likable at that time on television was more important than anything else, including looks and talents. Bill Being Cosby. Being likable. <laughs> yeah, so look at that. Look at that yeah. But in general, so, so that's why Chris would never get series roles, because he would always they'd say he's not likable. So I'm just, and I'm thinking, and Donna, the problem is Donna can't act. She may have done a good reading for, for Gary, but when she got to NBC, the reading was horrible. But she herself says she's not an actress, so I'm not dishing, dissing her. And I said, okay, so, but this is the way my mind works. It's, all right, look, this is not very original, but she used to be a very popular ingenue, but now she's the age where she should play mothers. What about somebody like Meredith Baxter? So I'm suggesting, I'm not ordering, I'm suggesting you see Meredith Baxter, who hasn't been around for a while and maybe it'll work. Obviously it did. And they said, and then for the, for the guy, you know, I met a guy in New York and he was in a play called Bent, playing a German drag queen. So that's not gonna help. <laughs> but when I met him, outside of his character, you close your eyes and he sounds exactly like Aaron Alda. He has that nice speech pattern. He sounds that way and he's a tall, skinny guy. Anyway, the point is we flew him out and he got the part. Wow. But it was like off the top of my head. I said, there's a guy I met in New York. It's what would happen to me under pressure. I would come up with solutions in my office in NBC. I don't know how or why it worked that way. Or did you believe in the word providence? No, <laughs> I believed in me. <laughs> providence implies a higher power. Okay. <laughs> no, it was just these, this, these would, I, I still don't know why I had this ability or how, but it, but it did. Yes, you did. And that's why I was very, very successful in those rooms. Cause when there was an unsolvable problem, more often than not, I would come up with, well, how about A, B, or C, who they maybe hadn't seen or they would reconsider. And that's, that's why I did a good job of NBC. But that's the best example. Hey folks, Brian here. Mark and I often cringe when people call one-on-one -on -one next level a workshop studio because we are so much more than that. You and I both know that not all workshop studios are the same. And I can tell you with complete confidence that no other studio offers the same level of care or programming that we do. And we do so with pride. Here's just a few examples. I'm Emily, and before One on One Next Level, I was in a super dark place in my career. I tried a lot of things to find representation, but nothing seemed to work and I felt invisible. Then almost as a Hail Mary, I signed up for a manager session. It was incredible, but it was also the thing to land me a manager. Since then, I booked a national commercial, I've gone on to create a thriving voiceover career and signed with an agent, all through these classes and programs. 
One-on-one -on -one Next Level has been the single most important thing that's influenced my acting career and life in so many ways. I'm Neil. In the last year, I booked two co-stars and one top-of-show guest star on major TV series. I also shot my first lead in a feature film. In fact, I've hit 20 big milestones thanks to the connections that I've made in classes at one-on-one -on -one Next Level. The key has been getting in front of casting directors. And that's why I love one-on-one -on -one Next Level. If you're not a member yet, what are you waiting for? Every actor deserves face time with the people in the business who can move your career forward. And one-on-one -on -one Next Level can help you do that. Did you know one-on-one -on -one Next Level produces over 335 events and classes each month? Whether you join us in person or attend on Zoom, you could meet with A-list casting directors, filmmakers, TV showrunners, and executive producers, as well as agents and managers when you become a member. These days, it's harder and harder to get real face time with industry pros, but one-on-one -on -one Next Level makes it possible. To become a member, visit www.oneononenextlevel.com and click join. We can't wait to hear your success story. Let's get to the book. So you, you have an amazing career, Joel. What made you say to yourself, hey, I'm going to write this book? Well, what I said, I'm going to write this book because it wasn't suggested to me. I, someone else suggested. Oh, okay, here we go. Yeah. Well, that's perfect. Now they can see. Someone else see? Some, by the way, this is not for sale because this has a banner across. The, the ones will be out like in the next month for sale. My name is Sex Drugs and Pilot Season. And how will they be able to help people get it, Joel? Well, okay. You, uh, this, and you will be able to get it in all the normal places through Amazon or directly through the publisher, Bear, Manor Media. The book will, the pub date is January 23rd or 24th, I forget. But it will go on Amazon before that. So just keep looking for sex, drugs, and pilot season. Great, right? Okay. And there, I guess, look who's in the center. <laughs> <laughs> looking man. <laughs> so, so, so what did, what, what did so, you say? You were writing one day, you said, I'm going to write a book. No. Um, I, I, I've, I've had, again, this is fortune, providence, whatever. I went to work at NBC, and I had met a couple. I needed an assistant. I needed a really good assistant. I, I, had, I was taken, I was hired to be head of talent for NBC from outside of NBC. Did you, I, can I ask how that happened? You all of a sudden got this invitation, hey, you'd like it? No, what happened is uh, I, had, I, had a lot of I had a lot of executive positions at networks. I started out in casting at CBS, in the CBS casting department, where I cast the Bob Newhart show and a few other things. The first Bob Newhart show, the good one with Suzanne Bichette. <laughs> so, but so I was, I, I knew about working at studios and and uh, and networks. I very seldom was an independent casting director. I was usually always affiliated with something like that. So, um, I lost track of the you question. Did, uh, the invitation to be to NBC. NBC. Well, what happened was it seemed so much of my casting work was at Paramount. I mean, I cast uh, Taxi for Paramount as an independent casting director. I did a little movie for Paramount called Grease. Mm -hmm. I did another little movie for Paramount called Airplane. So I did so much work at Paramount in between Grease, between Airplane, then Cheers, for instance. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, I'm trying to think, did Cheers happen? No, I was already at NBC by the time Cheers happened. But um, so, um, there was a woman who was head of, so I'm head of casting at Paramount, and I get a call from the woman who was then head of casting for NBC. It was a woman named Ethel Winant. That's, that, that could do a whole three-hour story about Ethel. But when I first worked for CBS in 1972, it was Ethel was the one who hired me to be part of her department. So Ethel Winant and and also at NBC, CBS, we did something different. The casting department actually cast shows that were on CBS. Our little group department cast all the MTM shows, Mary, Tyler Moore, Phyllis, Rhoda, whatever. We also did Hawaii Five-0. We also did Gunsmoke. We also got hired to cast the Waltons, even though it's an outside company, because we were so good and the outside companies wanted us. So they paid CBS for our services. So that was Ethel. And Ethel was an extraordinary woman. 
Um, we could go into her at some other point, but she was she she. There's a whole school of casting directors that descend directly from Ethel. She sounds like she, and she sounds like she was a fan. Well, she was a fan. I had originally met her through the guy who I was dating at that time happened to be her best pal, huh. so that's how we met. But then she 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 said, "Look, I need someone in my department who knows recent actors from New York." She said, "There's nobody in my department who knows all these New York actors anymore." Anyway, the point is she hired me. So now we jump 20 years later, and she asks me to come in and replace her at NBC. She had, she had gone on to a whole other career. There's one person who I haven't brought up by the name of Fred Silverman. Okay. Fred Silverman was head of NBC's programming when I first worked there in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And he was the one who hired Ethel, and Ethel saved his ass continually over a long period of time. So now we're jumping 20 years. Fred has become a huge success at both NBC and then ABC. And now he's been hired to take NBC out of the toilet where it was. And why does Ethel want to go into it? What, what's the new career she went into? Well, uh, earlier she wanted to go into production. She wanted to produce and she went to work for Children's Television Workshop, for oh, Sesame Street. Okay. So she, but that stuff never really worked out for her. So by the time we get to this time period now, she's not doing anything. And she, Fred hires her to, you know, set up the casting department at NBC. This is probably around 19. Uh, when I got to around the very late seventies, what what happened is she's there and it's it's still a disaster. I mean, the whole network is a disaster for many many things. And I get a call from Ethel, and Fred said yes, she could leave to take another job at NBC if she replaced herself. <laughs> so she calls me and says, "Do you want to replace me?" <laughs> right now, I'm head of talent at Paramount, so it's you know it's a logical move, and I you know it's sort of a bizarre Oedipus complex where you're replacing your mother, not your father. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, when she's and, and also NBC basically tripled my salary. Wow. From Paramount. Okay. I'm leaving. Yeah. <laughs> Gary Nardino, who was who hired me at Paramount and I'm leaving like six months later or less. He was not thrilled, but I did it. Anyway, so that's how I got to NBC. Okay. But that was and when I got to NBC, the department was horrible. I mean, literally there was one good per there were two good people. One left literally the day I got there because she'd been trying to get out, and the other one was still there. A guy named Steve Kolzak. I could show you pictures too, but it doesn't matter. But the point is, I took the job because I knew <clears throat> when I worked for Ethel at CBS how powerful that job was. Not only powerful, but the the um, you got an instant reputation. It was really one of the most important jobs around, where everybody knew you and. It just, you know, I just said yes, I've always, and it paid well. Of course. But uh, so I took the job. And what were some of the major changes you said? Well, the major changes were they changed the entire, it literally, there was only, and again, this picture in here. Maybe this will become a reference book. <laughs> um, of course, at the end. If you look at this, this is really one of my first days in the office. And only the guy to the far right or left on the couch remained. All those other people on one side of the couch left. Wow. <laughs> All of them. That is not you with the beard, Joel. No, this is me from the back of okay. my beard. Okay. Steve Polzak was the only one who stayed. Okay. Wow. So Amazing. I got rid of all those other people. This, this one is you, right here. Yes, from the wow, back. That's incredible. But this yeah. was, you see the boxes. This is literally just a few days after I moved into NBC. Wow. So uh, there's something else about it. I can, sh well, I, I'm, if I show her a picture, I'm not, uh, there's a woman in this group. Okay. So the, the main thing is the, the, the changes that you felt you made for the better. At NBC? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, here. First, coincidentally, and you may have heard of these people, Linda Otto, um, Joan Barnett. Linda Otto was a great casting director. She had a, had a partner, Joan. We were all friends, um, but Linda decided she didn't want to cast anymore, and they were breaking up the company. 
I knew I had a group of terrible people, so I offered everyone in their company a job. I said, I'll hire all of you, <laughs> whoever, whoever wants to come. Turned out only two people wanted to come, which is fine. But one of them I hired at a director level, and you know, network, they're all levels. So at a direct, it goes manager, director, vice president. So I hired one woman at a director level, which is the same as Steve. And then I hired one woman at a vice presidential level. Um, because she had much, much more experience and she was going to be, she would be the one who dealt with movies and miniseries, but she'd also produce movies and miniseries. So she was a very good choice. Her name was Joan Barnett. So there's a picture of a woman who you saw in that picture, whose name I forget. She actually filed a complaint with me, uh, a, a real complaint with human resources that she felt I should have raised her from a director level to a vice president level and given her the job of overseeing movies and miniseries from the casting side. Problem was she was a fucking moron and knew nothing. Literally every idea out of her mouth was horrible. But she actually filed a complaint and the complaint was that she didn't get the job because she wasn't gay but I had hired my friend Joan because Joan was gay and I was only hiring my gay friends. Wow. Joan, bless her soul, because she's gone now. Joan was short, dumpy, born in Queens with a New York attitude. <laughs> but she may have looked like a duck and quacked like a duck, but she wasn't a duck. <laughs> so <clears throat> Brandon Tartikoff has to call me in to his office because it's a real complaint. And I started laughing. And when I said to Brandon, to Brandon, I said, no, I said, fortunately, said Joan is very much heterosexual. She's had a gorgeous younger boyfriend, about 10 years younger than her for the last 10 years. He was 21 when they met and she was 30 and they're still together. And, you know, I, uh, I, I did the joke of, you know, of looking like a duck. I said, but she ain't a duck. What you happened know? to the woman who complained? Never saw her again. There you go. I'll never lie. saw her again. She yeah. never worked in the bill. She may have worked at some other part of NBC, but that was it. But that was, but literally it was a, um, uh, being called on. And I just was laughing, you know, when this happened. So was the thing that moved you to write the book, was it like a, a desire that you just said? No, the thing that moved me to write the book was, I was very lucky. Well, it's, things happen in my life that I just don't know why. Why, when I rejected all of the people that NBC sent me as an assistant when I first took the, 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 uh, the job, and then someone who worked there said, look, there's this woman I met through a temp agency, she's great, ask for her. So I did ask for her. Her name was Arlen Phoenix. And she came in, the minute she came in, within 30 seconds, I knew it was perfect. I knew it was absolutely perfect. What, what, what were some of the memories of, what, what did you know in 30 seconds? Instantly empathy. Uh -huh. Empathy was flowing across on both sides. Just something about her manager, yeah. I could feel. And I started saying, well, you know, look, I would love you for this job. And she said, yeah, I'd be very interested. But um, she said, but they're not going to, they'll only pay me a good salary if I've worked for another vice president. And I said, well, of course you worked for another vice president. You worked for this one, this one, this one. She said, well, I can't lie. And I said, yeah, but I can. <laughs> <laughs> so that was one thing. And then I would say, what are the hours? And the hours are... 10 to whenever we finish. She said, we well, you know I have a family. I've got five kids. And uh, I said, well, you know what? If you're working late, bring in here. We'll feed them at the studio. She said, well, you know, we're vegan. I said, well, then we'll bring in vegan food for them. Wow. Everything she said, I had an answer to. So, because I knew, I just knew that she would be great. You probably have heard of some of her children. River Phoenix, oh, King Phoenix. <laughs> And guess who got them the first job, their first agent? You did. So uh, the first agent was a woman named, she was the best kid agents in town at that time. Her name was Iris Burton. And I'd said to Arlen, I said, look, you, I know you got these kids. You moved out here to get them in show business. Would you like me to introduce them to the, who I think is the best agent? She said, of course, if it's not, you know, I said, yeah. So, uh, Iris, do you know Iris? Did you ever meet her? 
Iris uh, spent way too much time in front of her pool. She had the baseball glove skin and completely shoe polished black hair. And she talked like this with a gravelly voice from New York. You know, and she meets the kids. She said, you mean I got to sign the whole fucking family to just to get one of them? I said, yes. She said, said but where'd they get those names from? Yeah. That river kid is, he's gorgeous. <laughs> you know, that was the thing. But yeah, you got to take them all. So that's how the kids got started. Amazing. Wow. And River started working right away. He was the it young kid that year. Uh, and Joaquin was a little more serious, but whatever work he did yet, he was great. He was Leaf then. He wasn't Joaquin. Uh -huh. so back to Leaf. And so you, there's, there's some, uh, a Did general... I answer your question? Yeah, no, that, that's, that, that's excellent. Well, I saw, oh, 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 so the point, no, I didn't ask. That. I was, that was all the lead up into yes. this thing is a change. Iris Burton, their agent, dies. The kid's agent died. This is like 10 years later. And now Joaquin is not as big as the Joker star, but he's a star. River had already died. So there's a lot of history that's gone on. And uh, I went to Iris's memorial service with the Phoenix kid, with, with uh, Joaquin and his mother. And then we went back to dinner at Joaquin's house. And uh, a lot of wine and a lot of weed came out of my pocket. And we, did, we just started talking about the old days. And remember, Re uh, Joaquin would have been eight when I first started working with his mother. Wow. So his mother and I started trading stories, of when, which he'd never heard. But he was laughing and carrying on. And he said, man, you've got to write this stuff down. Literally that night, I went down, went back home and started writing this stuff down. And I wrote two thirds of the first chapter, which is called David Hasselhoff, da, 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 blame oh. me. The blame <laughs> me because I did wind up giving him or you know, casting him in his, first, in, his, in his three network jobs. Wow. <laughs> so I'm, I'm responsible. Uh, <laughs> and and there, there's, there's definitely, I recall, a, a really good John Travolta story, because I know you, um, you became friends with him. Well, I don't know about friends, but I've known Travolta since he was 17. His, uh, his manager was my best friend. Okay. His manager is dead now, a guy named Bob Lamont. Bob Lamont had great taste and talent. The other people, his other clients were Jeff Conaway, Catherine Hellman, Patrick Swayze. Uh, it was some, some more that I don't remember, but that gives you an idea of, oh, Holland Taylor. So he had great, great talent. And, and but interesting so, so here's the, the, but here's how, here, this is how something that affected all of our lives. And I think it's the story that you're talking about is, um, so, uh, John gets cast on Welcome Back, Cotter. And within the first year, he's, he becomes this huge breakout character. And can I ask you, this was right from being doing musical theater, right? This is his first big yeah. Yeah, it was just, break. It, 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 yeah, he had only, the only movies he had done before, he had a, a part as a villain in, I think, Carrie. I think he had a 30-second part in there, and, and another tiny part in another movie. But that was it. So you know, his, first, his first important thing was, 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 uh, was Cotter. Um, Anyway, so I, I knew him socially through Bob. I had met him when he was 17, so I knew him, but I had nothing to do with getting him on Cotter at all. Lynn Stallmaster did call me, who cast it, and asked if I knew him, and I said, yes, and I think he's going to be a great star. You, you'll be brilliant. He'll be whatever. So um, anyway, Bob, uh, Bob Lamond and I had a ritual every Saturday. He'd come over to my house, and... We would bring our stack of reading for the week. I had I was casting Starsky and Hutch then, so I had all the and a few other um, episodes of other shows. I worked for a company then called Spelling Goldberg. They hired me year round, so I was mostly to do Starsky and Hutch, but an, oca an occasional Charlie's Angels episode, an occasional this, and a movie. Anyway, there was this movie. Um, it had just been rejected by ABC. And the woman who developed scripts came into my office. Her name is Cindy Dunn. And she said, ABC just turned this down for the fourth time. She kept on trying to rewrite it and rewrite it. She said, the only way they'll do it is if we could get a star, a big star. She handed me the script and she said, could you, can you do me a favor and please read this? I said, it's a favor. That's my job. <laughs> I said, of course I'll read it. It's a favor. Just give it to me. I read it, took it home. 
So Bob came over on Saturday for our weekly readings, and he's complaining the first thing. Uh, we sit on my back deck, which is no longer bigger than six feet wide, and we sit there reading and getting melanoma at the same time. We didn't know any better. <laughs> And he said, he said, oh, God, I don't know what to do. Travolta's all nuts. He hates what he's doing on Cotter. He wants to do something. He was offered the movie Days of Heaven that Richard Gere did. But they, he, they wouldn't give him a stop date. And he had, to be, he had literally a month to do something, which you can if, you, if the stars align. Anyway, and the, the, <laughs> I think Days of Heaven went on to shoot for eight months. <laughs> all, all, all in all. And I, I read this stupid title skip, The Boy in the Plastic Bubble. And I, by this time, I knew I could read and I, I knew how long it took to do things. And I said, Bob, here's your problem solver. Whatever I said, here's the rabbit you need to pull out of the hat. And I threw the script over it. And he read it when he got home and he liked it. And he said, no, this is really good. And I'm going to give it to John tonight. This is now Saturday night. Sunday, John's read the script and likes it and wants to do it. <laughs> now, you have to remember this time background is he's turned down every single thing that ABC had offered him for that summer. During the back. Uh, I mean, during during doing, yeah, the first hiatus from Carter. Mm -hmm. So I go in and I said to Cindy, I said, well, I said, do you think John Travolta is big enough to get this movie made? And she said, what? I said, he wants to do it. You're kidding. I said, no, he wants to do it. And that went up the ladder that way, through Aaron and Len, same thing. He wants to do this? <laughs> yes, he wants to do it, but and no you had, month. Month. Huh? you had one month till That's, the show started. Yeah, one month. Yeah. yeah. And uh, anyway, he um, finally, it's like the, they all realized it was real when we made a cash offer, and he rejected the cash offer until we doubled it or tripled it. So then it became real. So that's how, and then, you know, because I had a little relationship with him, but I was on the set every day for that. And that's when we, the relationship, or what do you call it? Um, really, it was without Bob. It was, there was always Bob in between, but Bob, and, and we got to know and like each other a lot. And that was also where he met Diana Highland. Do you know that story? No. The woman who played his mother on the show, and they fell in love, and she died a year later, Whoa. less than a year later, of breast cancer. You know, yeah. so uh, anyway, so that's how, I don't know if I answered that story, but that's, yeah. that's the best Travolta story. It's good, really, yeah, absolutely. And then um, the things would happen. I mean, I just, today I just texted him saying something about Kirstie Alley because she died. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, so we're, we're always, he's, he never sleeps, so we do a lot of midnight texting. <laughs> and he's three hours away, you know, he lives in Florida. Oh. So, um, but that's where our relationship picked. Later on, uh, well, we're making, the, we're doing the movie of Greece. This is like years later, we're doing the movie of Greece. And uh, I get a call from Bob saying Travolta needs, Travolta feels Danny should have another song in the first act. Now, neither one of you are going to know Greece as well as I do, but you were absolutely right. On the, in the original stage play, you know, stage musical, the only thing he's in is Summer Nights in the beginning, and then he doesn't sing until the second act. So he was very right. And so I said, we don't want to say, look, why don't we have to get an input to do a new song? Why don't we just give him the lead in Grease Lightning? Because that was the Kinnicky use on stage does the lead. And perfect solution. <laughs> so I began, <laughs> what's the word? I mean, that's he a loved the idea too. Well, of course he loved it. Like years later, I found out there was no way he was not going to do that <laughs> just by exercising his power of I'm the star. Right. But, <laughs> but the way it initially first came about was, you know, a polite, I need a song. I need, it. and I was the one who said, but of course, years later, he said, there's no way I wasn't going to do it. But we handled it very well in the movie because Jeff Conaway came across pretty good too in that. But the, the choreographer, the choreographer was dead set against that, by the way. Really? Pat Birch. Pat Birch was an originalist. You know, she Sixth did the original, the original yeah. off-Broadway musical, everything should be like that. She did not like the movie because the movie changed too many things for her. But she did a great job choreographing the movie. A great job. So, That's great. whatever. Yeah. So, Joel, uh, to wrap up uh, as far as your book, 
Uh, what would you like to say to our audience about your book? Well, I would like you. I'd like you to first of all buy the damn thing. Okay, the, good. Buy the, the, the damn thing should okay. be coming out. Sex, drugs, and pilot season. <laughs> Um, by the end of January. Well, by the time this is, we're going to release this in March, so this will be trying. Oh, then it'll, it should already be out in your, in your bookstores. God, is that the way I look? No, oh, yeah. Don't even think no. twice. Um, I said, and it'll be, get it through Amazon, yeah, or it will yeah. be all over. And the book is, well, it's about my journey. It's about how I started life, how, how I started life growing up on my grandfather's farm in Brooklyn in 1942. There were still farms and how I, how I got from, how I had to get from the farm to boardrooms of GE <laughs> and RCA. And, and how I got from there to there, I still don't know how I got, how I did it. But if you read the book, you'll see. One, one, one aspect, one job seems to lead to another, leads to another, or I decide to take off and not work. But somehow, um, I have had a very interesting life. And, and continue uh, to. And, and continue to, you yeah. know, even at this age. Well, you're an artist, Joel. But yeah, I also discovered photography. If you go to joeltherm.com, everything's for sale, including me. So... Um, no, it's, uh, it's, it turns out that this period of my life, I never expected this period of my life to be an incredibly artistic, active point in my life. You know, I thought I'd be sitting on a beach or lying on a beach, and it turns out I cannot sit down on the beach. I have to keep walking and doing something. That's great. So I'm doing it. That's good. It's, it's, it's amazing. I, yeah, it, it's been it's such, such an amazing journey. journey. Yeah. And it's an amazing journey. I'm 80 years old and I think I got at least another 20 more. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't done it yet, grab the backstage pass. You've got to get the backstage pass. There's behind the scenes footage. We've taken the biggest takeaways from the episode and written them down for you. There's also tools and resources to help move your career forward. It's the easiest way to turn this podcast into a tool for your career, as opposed to something you just listen to as you're doing the dishes.